Thank you so very much, and thank you for this beautiful um, introduction. As you can imagine, it's always a little bit weird. Yeah, but maybe you want to take some questions later. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I like this sound. Um, it's always a little bit weird to be introduced like this, because um, when you're in the fishbowl, you don't know you're in the fishbowl. So I don't wake up every morning thinking I'm doing great revol revolutionary things. Even though there are days when I look at myself and I'm like, yeah, Silvana, you're doing great revolutionary things. Um, for those who don't know me, I would like to do a short introduction of myself. And I would love to um, spend the time we have together as interactive as we can. So I encourage you, I invite you to write down questions, uh, ask anything you like. My um, rule is any question goes, I cannot answer every question, but you can ask every question. My name is Silvana Hildegard Simons. I was born in 1971 in Suriname. It was a colony of the Netherlands, as was at the time Curaçao, Aruba, St. Martin, um, Saba, Stacia, I'm forgetting one, Bonaire, of course. My country of birth um, was um, emancipated in 1975, and before that, my parents took me um, as a small child of about 17, 18 months um, here, to the Netherlands. And they started a life here, and it was a very normal, happy uh, childhood I had. I come from a very interesting family background, just to give you a little bit of um, context. By the time I was born, my, I was my father's 16th baby, one six, and my mother's second. They found each other with a huge um, age gap between them. They found each other, fell in love, had a baby, and moved with the baby to the Netherlands. And I grew up in Amsterdam in a very multicultural um, uh, neighborhood. In my classroom were kids whose parents were from Turkey, Pakistan, Morocco, Suriname. Some of us were black, other, others were um, um, Indian. Uh, and of course, there were Dutch children also. As a young child, I never really realized that I was living in a society that wasn't built for me, yet I've always known that I was living in a society that wasn't built for me, as much of the multiculturalism around me. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a sensory thing. You look at the world around you and you're like, well, I don't really see a lot of people that look like me, but that can mean two things. I'm dismissible or I'm special, one of the two. And I think later on in life I decided that it was going to be the fact that I was special. The, most of the people in the Netherlands will have gotten to know me about 30 years ago, if they were around, obviously, as a TV presenter. I was one of the first VJs in the Netherlands, which means video jockey, and it's nothing more or nothing less than um, presenting video clips as a DJ does on the radio. We used to do it on television, and I used to work for the first commercial television station in the Netherlands that was aimed at kids and young people called TMF, which was our own equivalent of MTV. And of course, we were much cooler because we spoke Dutch. Um, how I got there is a very funny story because I used to be a dancer. I studied dance from an early age um, because I always knew I was going to be a dancer. In fact, my name, Silvana, most of you, when you read it, you will read S-Y-L, right? S-Y-L-V-A-N-A. -A. The truth is, my passport says S-Y, sorry, S-I-L-V-A-N-A. -A. And that's because when I was 10, I decided I was going to be a famous dancer, and I needed a, a, a stage name, and I needed a fancy name, so I thought the Y was fancier than the I, so I changed it when I was like 10, 11, and I told my parents I'm changing my name because later when I grow up, I'll be very famous, and the Y is just sexier. I never became, my dream was to become the first black solo dancer for the National Ballet in the Netherlands, and that never happened. I was nearly, I was never, nowhere near good enough. But I did make a career in entertainment. I started as a dancer and I danced with many artists. I used to dance in clubs. 
all over um, Europe and travel all over the world as a back backup dancer for famous people. And during one of those performances in a TV studio, I already happened to be pregnant with my first child, but people didn't really notice except here. And um, I was dancing as a backup dancer, and the head of the production company who was uh, producing this TV show said, I don't know who she is, but I would like her to come to an audition. Obviously, I couldn't do the audition. I was pregnant, and after I had my baby, and, you know, <laughs> um, how do I say this? Got myself back together. I went for an audition, and I ended up, like I said, as one of the first VJ presenters for this station. Now, I'm telling you this because I hadn't heard of Paul Robeson before the invitation, um, Baruch, I have to admit. But when I started doing my research, it was kind of eerie because I thought, yeah, we do have a lot in common. Um, when I was in entertainment, nobody questioned my entertainment skills, ever. I could walk in a room and say, ah, I'm a dancer, and they say, of course you're a dancer. I'm an actress, yes, of course you can act. I even convinced some people I could sing, and I really cannot sing, but everybody believed that I could sing. There was no questions asked. Fast forward 20 years into my career. By now I'd done many different TV shows, famous shows like some of you might know, Dancing with the Stars was an international success, and I did housing shows and talk shows and all kinds of things. And at one point I was a regular sidekick for a very popular daily TV show in the Netherlands called De Wereldraai Door, translated to As the World Turns, but not to be mistaken with the other As the World Turns. And during that show, another guest was seated right um, across from me. Older guy, not even a Dutch guy, because um, he's originally from, I think it's Hungary, but uh, Czech, Czechia. But um, he is well known in the Netherlands. He used to be a sportsman, and uh, he was invited that day to talk about the refugees fleeing Africa, entering Europe through Italy. So imagine, there's a host sitting at the head of the table. I'm here, daily sidekick, and across from the table, which is like, you know, here, is this guy. And he's talking about what he notices and experiences as the refugees come and how he's helping them. And he's a great storyteller, so it's quiet in the studio, like really quiet. We're all listening to him. And then at some point, for, for a reason I still don't know, he, he goes, um, yeah, I'm always nice to these, to these blackies, you know. And it's hard to translate, but the, the word he used in Dutch, swartjes, it's a derogatory word, it's a slur. And he also made this hand gesture, like, you know, these. And I, and I thought about it for a second, like literally, I thought, swatches, and I had this discussion in my mind, and I thought, okay, Silvana, what are you going to do? Aren't you that mother that tells her children that they should always speak up when they see injustice? Yes, you are. Are you going to say something? And if so, what are you going to say? And more importantly, how are you going to say it? Because you have to understand, it's been 25 years of me, and nobody knew this, juggling through this um, landscape, this media landscape, making sure that a moment like this would never happen. I wasn't gonna get involved in no discussion about racism, human rights, and all those things. I was just an entertainer, and I went to work, and I came home from work, and I was a mom, and that's it. But now I, this guy was sitting across the table from me, and I realized I had to say something. And it wasn't just because of my children, who would definitely question me had, had I not said anything, but it was also because I realized that here you are in a TV studio, live TV. If you are not going to speak up, Silvana, you are shutting down so many other people who may not feel like they have the power to speak up, who may have a very different relation to the person saying these things. If you don't speak up, you are silencing everybody that looks like you. 
So I spoke up and I asked the question, why did you use that word? That was the question. And that's the question that changed my life. Like, totally. As soon as I'd asked that question, I was no longer a popular TV personality. I was now public enemy number one. I had dared to question the older white guy sitting in front of me, talking about black people like they were not even human. But I was the one who had made a terrible mistake by asking him that question. It was the start of a very personal journey for me because as I said before, up until that time, I was like, I'm not getting involved in that. I'm just a TV presenter. I smile, I dance, I kick my feet. That's enough. But there was no way back. From that moment on, there was no way back. So from that moment on, I knew I had now made myself into this person that was part of a social discussion and that was part of a movement that had started a few years earlier, not by me, but by other brave people who started to question the tradition of Black Pete in this country. Anybody not familiar with Black Pete? We all know who Black Pete is. So a few years before this moment, um, other people had started the movement of questioning Black Pete. And up until that moment, I was not part of that discussion. I was too scared. And I'll get back to what you just said, Baruch, about capitalism. So, um, now I'd open, I had opened my mouth. I was part of this discussion. And I thought, well, here we go. So I started learning a lot, reading a lot, talking a lot to other people, and opening my mouth, especially when it came to the racism in the Netherlands. Because even though I hadn't spoken about it for 25 years into my career, obviously, I'd faced it. And obviously, I had faced it all my life, wherever I went. I never dealt with it publicly. I never spoke about it publicly, but it's been present forever. And then I realized very soon that if you are going to speak up against racism, you're going to have to speak up against sexism. And you're going to have to speak up against um, validism. I don't know if that's the correct English word, um, validisme. Ableism, thank you, Charlie. And you're going to have to speak up against capitalism. These are all intertwined. These are all part of the same system that's marginalizing people daily by the dozens, by the hundreds, sorry, by the hundreds, by the ten thousands, every, everywhere all over the globe. And then I realized that, yes, as a celebrity, you can sometimes be invited on a talk show to talk about your ideas and then you can, you know, you can have a, a, a moment on TV, on the radio, but that's it. You're not really changing anything. And I looked at all these people who had started this uh, anti-racism movement a couple of years earlier and I thought, wow, I couldn't do what they do. They get up every weekend, every, every day, every morning and they, they organize demos and they you know, they're real activists, I, I, I can't do that. By this time, obviously, I was kind of a spoiled princess from having that career for so long. But I did realize I had another talent, and it's the talent of speech. I knew I was a great debater, and I knew I was capable of asking questions. It had been my job for so long. So I decided that politics was my realm. And then I entered politics. <laughs> And it's like a trip you cannot explain. It's a whole different world. But it's a world that I've come to love. Why? Because you can get things done. Small things sometimes, big things, big things other times, but you can get things done. So at the end of 2016, I founded my own political party. And I named it Article One. Because that was where, uh, where we would leave from in all of our ideas and uh, ideals. Article 1, the first article of the Dutch constitution that says we are all equal and discrimination of any kind is prohibited. 
It turned out to be a problem, that name, so the judge forced us to change the name. We held a poll with, uh, amongst our um, party members, and the new name was Bai Ain, which means like together. And I love that name. From that moment on, we started our political journey. And it has led us five years later, because this is our anniversary year, five years later to not only one seat in parliament that I hold, but seven more seats in four different municipalities in the Netherlands. And all these seats, I'm very proud to say, are taken by people of color. Because one thing I knew, starting a political party is not just about writing a great manifesto and striving for an ideal world. It's in the doing. So when we have, um, um, what's the word, uh, a facultura, openings, job openings at our party, we, we don't make any mistake. It's going to be very clear that yes, everybody's welcome, but if we have two people and they're equally um, uh, fit for the job, and one is a white man and the other is a black woman, the black woman is getting the job. And we are not ashamed of this. And, other, and some people will say, oh, that's discrimination. Well, yes, it is. And it's necessary. So, <laughs> so every day we strive to live what we stand for. And it's not been easy. I can tell you many stories about the journey. And i again, willing to answer all of your questions. But I deliberately did not make a presentation for today. I thought I'd give you a small introduction of who I am. I am now. Uh, 51 years old, I'll be 52 in January. I'm the proudest grandmother you'll ever meet. Do not ask me any questions about my grandchild because it will be all we are going to talk about. <laughs> I'm a mother of two grown-up children. My son is 30 years old, my daughter is 26, and she's the mother of my grandchild. Uh, my team in Parliament is eight people. Again, it's a very colorful team. We live what we say. We would like everybody to live. And um, I'm very proud to be here today because being here in the context of Paul Robeson, is, is, it's, it's a huge honor. And I was just saying to Charlie, um, you know, like I say, when you're in the fishbowl, you don't know you're in the fishbowl. So I just go to work every day and I just try and do my best. But I'm sometimes humbled when I notice that for other people, yeah, it's, it, it, it must be quite a story this little little woman starting a political party in an environment that is not very friendly. Um, but we do it with great joy, great pride, and great uh, gratitude every day. So here I am. This is me. I would love to know who you all are, but I can imagine maybe you have some questions. I'm very willing to answer them. Thank you. <laughs> 